Okay, uh, our final presentation before lunch is uh, by Mark, and he's going to be talking about entrainment in the stock assessment. Uh, yep, hello, my name is Mark Chambers, and yeah, my presentation is entitled um, Implications of Entrainment for Stock Assessment. So I did my PhD on southern bluefin tuna, and one of the things that I looked at um, was the popular uh, spatial dynamics of juveniles, which is a subject that's been looked at by other people in, in fairly good detail. Um, just a few things that are relevant to the population dynamics of juveniles. So the, the population is thought to be genetically distinct. There's a single spawning ground off of Northwest Australia, south of Indonesia, um, and there's been genetic testing and there's no suggestion from disparate feeding grounds of genetic hom homogeneity. Uh, Great Australian Bight is a key region for juveniles. It's mentioned by Rich earlier on. Um, so from here, two to five-year-olds undertake seasonal cyclic migrations, um, either to the, great, uh, to the Southeast Indian Ocean or to the T Tasman Sea. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the, the, the destination of these, of these migrations, the, the final destination is, of course, beyond the previous experience of the juveniles that first undertake those migrations. Right. Um, and I showed in a paper pretty good evidence, I think, that the migrants um, that undertake these, these migrations tend to home to the, to the same migration. So um, you have two-year-olds here um, from, from a genetically homogeneous population. They arrive here as two-year-olds. Um, they, they summer together in the Great Australian Bight. One group goes one way and one group goes another way and they home to the same wintering ground. Right, this may not be that, may not be that unusual in fisheries, but it's, it's weird, right? Like, um, how can you explain this? It's not explained by imprinting because they haven't been there before. It's not explained by um, density dependent habitat selection because they haven't been there before. And it's not explained by genes, right? Because they're supposedly genetically identical. So what mechanism could explain this, this movement behavior? Right. Sometimes it's good to read um, other people's research. Um, so I read a paper by Ian McQuinn, um, Metapopulations of Atlantic Herring, where he, he um, proposes the adopted migrant hypothesis. Uh, to, um, to explain aspects, peculiarities in the distribution of uh, spawning populations of Atlantic herring, right? So um, one, of, one of the features of populations of Atlantic herring is um, they tend to be sympatric, right? So we have, um, we have overlapping populations, spawning distributions for most of the year. And then at some point in time, one group goes one way and maybe a different time of year, another group goes a different way and spawns and then, then they reassemble for some reason. And uh, it's believed that the, that the progeny of these spawning groups um, don't necessarily home to their, to their natal origin, but they do tend to repeat spawn, repeat, repeat home to the same spawning grounds, but not necessarily their natal origin. Um, and uh, so according to McQuinn, um, he's just that first time migrants adopt a contingent through social interactions um, with experienced conspecific. So they just learn spawning migration by following um, individuals that have already spawned. And they adopt that um, spawning migration and they go on it in future years and contribute to um, uh, leading um, future generations um, along the same um, migration path. So um, McQuinn referred it to it as the adop adopted migrant hypothesis. It's probably more commonly referred to as um, entrainment nowadays. Um, and Alec McCall um, described a similar uh, um, situation with um, Pacific herring and called it the go with the older fish mechanism. I don't necessarily like any of these names, but entrainment seems to be the one that's gained the most traction. So I'm gonna try and um, convince you now that a collapse of a, of a fishery off New South Wales here during the 1980s um, is consistent with the entrainment mechanism in southern bluefin tuna. So historically, there have been three fisheries um, or fisheries off three states of Australia for um, juvenile surface schools of southern bluefin tuna, uh, Western Australia, South Australia, and New South Wales. So the two that are most relevant to this talk are South Australia and New South Wales that are both highly seasonal, right? Um, so the South Australian fishery is the only one that operates now or the only surface fishery. Um, and it oper operates between about December and April when the, when the juveniles are in the Great Australian Bight um, in the austral summer. Um, and uh, the New South Wales fishery, um, sort of between October 
and December when it previously operated, um, the juveniles would migrate um, from South Australia. Some of them would go to the coastal waters of New South Wales. Um, they'd reach a low, upper limit of about Sydney um, by August, and then they would um, they'd be uh, they'd be harvested by um, pole and line uh, fishers with live bait as they headed south. Uh, so fish, the fishing mortality of this, this group appears to have been pretty high, right? Um, so, so John Hampton estimated from 1960s tagging data that um, the, the fishing mortality of this group might have been 0 0.8, right? Um, which is pretty high for a population that lives as long as Southern Blue Finchina, although it's only for a couple of years of their life, I guess. Um, but it, it was probably even higher during the 1970s and 80s than it was during the 1960s because um, one of the things that happened, for instance, was um, pole boats started cooperating with Persanage from the 1970s. So the, the, the pole boats would harvest the population, um, they would locate schools, and then they would, they would call in a Persaner um, who would clean up the rest of the school. Um, initially, Persaners weren't successful at harvesting southern bluefin because they don't remain at the surface, but if the pole boat keeps chumming, um, they can keep the they can keep the school at the surface for purse saying, and this was a very efficient way of catching southern bluefin off of New South Wales. Um, the fishery collapsed in 1985, the New South Wales fishery, um, and explanations given for this at the time were kind of the usual suspects. You know, maybe it was slow recruitment, it was a recruitment problem, or maybe it was um, insufficient survivorship from the other fisheries, Western Australia and South Australia, which presumably the fish had to pass through at some point, at least momentarily, before arriving in New South Wales. Um, but I suggest that neither of these explanations really pass muster. I uh, have the catch of the three fisheries here on the left-hand side with New South Wales down the bottom. Um, so <clears throat> the catch increased slowly from, like during the 60s, it was erratic during the 70s in New South Wales, and then it collapsed in the 1980s. Um, but the South Australian fishery remained viable through the 1980s. There was probably lower abundance in the Great Australian Bight at that time, but it wasn't affected nearly to the same extent as New South Wales. Also, um, the New South Wales fishery caught smaller individuals. The South Australian fishery tended to catch mostly individuals that were larger than were caught in New South Wales, at least at the start. So um, New South Wales fishery initially was um, very much dependent upon 70 centimetre fish, 70 centimetre group. And uh, so this was just before they were turning two. And uh, so it was before they were being fished as two year olds in South Australia. So there was some harvesting of one year olds in South Australia, particularly in the 1970s. But even then most of the catch was, um, was two plus where they had an opportunity to first migrate to, to New South Wales. Um, <clears throat> the catch limit was introduced in 1983-84. Uh, um, and it was progressively slashed, I guess, trying to get a uh, a recovery from the New South Wales fishery, but um, it never occurred. And after the, after the catch limit was introduced, the South Australian fisheries increasingly targeted older fish, trying to um, uh, s s supply fish to the to the um, sashimi market. So there was very little catch of one-year-olds um, during the 1980s, and there was no recovery of um, of New South Wales population. So I've suggested that um, neither recruitment failure or low survivorship from South Australia and New South Wales kind of explain the collapse, but it's, it's readily explained if you assume that um, the migration from South Australia to New South Wales was, was governed by entrainment, right? So um, very high fishing mortality of this group um, that migrated south um, depleted the, the Tasman Sea contingent. There were very few juveniles re returning from New South Wales to the Great Australian Bight. So um, there were no experienced migrators to, to guide the juveniles back um, to New South Wales. And so the, um, the population memory of the Tasman Sea contingent was lost, so to speak. So the New South Wales fishery collapsed because of high fishing mortality off New South Wales, not off of South Australia or Western Australia. So they killed the goose, laid the golden eggs. There have been a few attempts to simulate entrainment before, um, but I haven't really been, um, I haven't felt as though they've sort of captured the essence of how I think it operates. So I've had a go at that here. Um, <clears throat> it's a very simple simulation. Uh, uh, so it's constant recruitment each year. There's 10 million recruits into this, 
interaction area here. Um, and then at the same time, there are, there are two contingents um, that are also in this region at the same time. And uh, the two million recruits each adopt one of these two contingents depending on their relative abundance, right? And this is, a, this is a, an assumption that's being included in all simulations of entrainment. There's some sort of relationship between the size of the contingents and the adoption of those contingents by juveniles. Um, another aspect that I think is essential in a, in a simulation of um, entrainment is contingent specific mortality. Without that, there's no benefit of entrainment for the fish. But of course, this is gonna be common in any situation where you have alternative migrants alternative migration routes. So I set, um, I set the mortality of the Western contingent at 0 0.2, and I vary the mortality of the Eastern contingent and uh, see what happens, basically. Um, so after the juveniles have uh, chosen a contingent and they've migrated, I simulate, in train, uh, I simulate mortality, and I iterate age. Um, Six-year-olds disperse, the ones that have just turned six, and the ones that have just turned five, two to five, return to the to the interaction area and the situation can, uh, repeats itself. So I said um, there's a relationship between um, the, uh, the proportion of the juveniles entrained in, train, in each, um, uh, the, the proportion of the demonstrators, so the experienced migrants entrained in, in each um, contingent in terms of the adoption of that contingent um, by the, the naive uh, migrants, the first time migrants. And this is, the relationship that I've assumed for my simulation, right? This is pretty important, I think, that you get this, um, some, something like this, so that there's a high probability that you'll get multiple contingents that'll be stable across a range of total mortalities. And it also um, incorporates conformance, what's called conformance, so that um, when one population becomes dominant, one of the contingents, then essentially all of the, the juveniles adopt that um, contingent. And in real populations, I think this could be easily tuned by um, evolution. I think it's exactly the kind of trait that could be easily tuned by evolution in a kind of average sense. Um, so I said that differences um, between contingents in mortality was important. Um, so initially, I set uh, the mortality of both contingents at 0 0.2, and then I increase ZE in year 20. So these numbers here are, are different. Um, values of ZE and the curves of the different responses of the adoption of that contingent, um, the Eastern contingent, uh, by those juveniles. So when the mortality is the same, 5 million juveniles adopt each contingent each year, and that's constant. But when the mortality is higher in the East, right, the population of the, of the Eastern contingent decreases, it therefore is smaller than the Western contingent, it attracts fewer recruits, right? So this is smart. Um, <clears throat> so the, 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 mort the mortality, the higher mortality in the east actually diverts future recruits away from that contingent, right? And that's, that's why entrainment evolves in populations. Um, so so in, in my simulation, at least, um, here where ZE is less than 0 0.65, um, we get a stable, we get two stable populations where the relative size of those depends on the difference in mortality. Um, but when ZE exceeds 0 0.65, um, the population continues to, to decline um, and uh, fewer and fewer contingents, fewer and fewer migrants adopt the eastern contingent and eventually um, collapses and uh, doesn't recover, of course. So we'll look at this particular um, scenario in a little bit more detail where the eastern contingent um, mortality is 0 0.7 after year 20. Um, in this case, uh, though, I, I add a condition where in year 37, after things have got really bad, um, total mortality returns to 0 0.2. So there's been like a moratorium in fishing and uh, so the population, the mortality returns to 0 0.2. So they're the same after that time, right? Um, and to compare the response of this entrained population with um, something else, I've also defined a fixed migration population where the fish just, um, adopt 5 million recruits irrespective of what's happening in the fishery. So each year, 5 million recruits go east and 5 go west. Um, and there's pretty good evidence of um, fidelity to overwintering grounds in southern bluefin. So I've also included that um, 
characteristic in the fixed population, although that assumption is not necessary. So this is what happens with the fixed population, um, pretty straightforward. I guess it's a bit unusual that um, there's, 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 there's homing, so this Western population is not affected by the higher mortality in the East, but you get um, nice age structured population. So this is the population before the first set of mortality on the one year old. So there's 5 million one year olds each year. Um, in the higher mortality, you get, you get fewer older fish. And then when you reduce the mortality, then the population magically rebounds as in stock um, projections. Compare this with um, the entrainment situation. Um, and here, the population declines in year 20. And as the population declines, um, fewer and fewer recruits are attracted to the Eastern contingent. So it continues to decline, continues to attract fewer um, recruits, less adoption, as I've called it. And in this case, those extra recruits are, uh, adopt the Western contingent. So, so here, the, the high mortality in the East leads to higher, higher abundance in the West. So it affects the way the population responds to fishing. Right? And of course, the cessation of fishing in year 37 doesn't lead to a recovery in the population as ha happens with collapsed fisheries. So in summary, why I think entrainment matters, um, it's really simple, right? All, all you need for this is younger fish to follow older fish, right? And uh, I think it's the most plausible explanation for, you also need obviously homing, but there's all, already good evidence of homing in several species. We already know that kind of happens. Um, so it's the best explanation for micro behavior that I can think of, at least for Southern Bluefin tuna. For Atlantic herring, it's reasonably well accepted and other species as well less so. Um, social learning is well accepted for other taxa like birds and whales and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and it allows populations to adapt to threats and opportunities like the increased mortality in the, in the Western contingent, for instance. And it produces dynamics that are not accommodated by, by stock assessment, right? Not even spatial stock assessments. You know, the, the, the transition matrices that were described earlier don't, don't capture this kind of behaviour. So Pettit Gass et al. contended that collapsed fisheries have suffered disruption to contingent structure, as opposed to depleted fisheries that are just depleted. Right? This is a really important distinction, I think. This is why fisheries don't, don't recover when they collapse. And this is, this is my opinion. Um, so when populations diverge substantially from model predictions, it's likely, or it's, it's maybe quite likely, I don't know, but I, I suspect entrainment. That's what I suspect when I see see that occurring in populations. And those are the papers that I've cited. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So we've got quite a bit of time for questions. Um, anyone else? I don't know, Andre. <laughs> As someone who actually has developed one of these models, um, a, a, a couple of things. The first thing is we actually have included this in a few of the cetacean assessments. So uh, the inverse of entrainment is that uh, if you're getting decent recruitment, and I think you showed that, is that the, un, the area from which you have, uh, that, that disappears, can actually recover to above what you would have recovered to initially, just because of the way the dynamics operate, because your, your recruitment is sort of constant. Um, and that sort of explains some of our whale populations that have increased above carrying capacity, essentially, is that you've lost some of the, the feeding grounds. Um, mm. So I think, they're, they're, and, and in fact, you can get this behavior quite easily with a, a production model uh, where you have common density dependence uh, across spatial regions. You don't need all the age structure and that stuff. It's three lines of algebra. Um, a homework assignment for my class coming up soon. Um, but the other thing that I think this is probably my main point is what we found was that uh, stochasticity is really important when you think about these, because yours were all deterministic simulations, I gather. Um, but once you allow for stochasticity, so if you have a system that has stochastic dynamics, um, essentially we found that these populations would by definition collapse because just stochastically, eventually, you end up with the sort of sink behavior. So we, we had to build in uh, essentially random dispersal to keep the population in a stochastic environment stable, even without fishing. So I think how the, the it, it, it's essentially, I think that the process is, a, is an important one, but 
uh, essentially it's, it's density dependent movement at, at the juvenile stages. Uh, but I think from the point of view of if we use these for policy evaluations, they're consequences of, of essentially random repopulations, which a herring are, are sort of well known for, uh, actually becomes quite important because you end up in a, in a, in a sort of single um, equilibrium state. It just collapses down to one subpopulation just because of the way those equations operate. Yeah, Rich. Yeah, that was really interesting, Mark. One of the questions I had was on re-establishment. So you're sort of showing it's a one-way track there, right? So over the last few years, there's been the re-emergence of a whole range of sizes of bluefin uh, on the New South Wales coast. Pro whether that's linked to the fact that there just are more of them at the moment that have been in the but how does it, could it re-establish and what's the possible mechanisms for re-establishment? Probably linked to some of the stochasticity that, right. yeah. I think that's one of the more, like, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that, that comes out of this, right? Um, like a lot of things to think about. And like one of those, one of those is spatial heterogeneity, uh, whatever. Um, but anyway, I, I think one of the things that's very interesting is like, I, I, it, it seems as though the reestablishment of the New South Wales population is a quite unlikely thing to happen. And there are, there are juveniles off New South Wales, and I initially thought, okay, this is, this is recovered. But I looked more closely at the recreational data and that sort of thing, and they catch mostly four-year-olds off there now, 20 kilos plus. And the recreational catch off New South Wales is very short. It tends to be the end of July, and there's a, there's a very brief period. So it, it hasn't, it hasn't re-established as it was. Now, now Portland in Victoria is more important than what it used to be. I think there's probably more off of Eastern Tasmania. So I think it's, it's an interesting thing and it depends on the, on the geometry of the situation. Like in, like in herring populations, there are certain recoveries that are more, more likely than others. Um, Icelandic, Icelandic spring spawning herring hasn't recovered after 50 years or something. So it's an interesting thing. And so there's a paper by, um, There's a paper by um, there's a paper by Alec McCall um, in 2012, and it's also from the ICES journal where he he talks about um, possible simple um, management uh, strategies for entrainment populations. And and one of the things like there's been a there's been a suggestion in populations that if, if you allow the population to, to 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 breed once, it won't collapse no matter what. And under entrainment, that's, that's not right, okay? Under entrainment, McCall says, you've got to let them breed at least twice. Um, so, yeah, so the stuff like that. But, but it, he says in, his, in, his, in that paper that, that recoveries become not a, a thing that will happen over time with a, with a certain, you know, tra trajectory. It it's becomes probabilistic. So there's a probable... A, you, 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 have, you have individuals that sort of um, move ex in exploratory behaviour. They don't, they don't follow the contingents, which I didn't... I didn't simulate, but that'll occur in any year and sometimes they'll be successful, right? Sometimes they'll find a viable route, they'll come back, they'll attract more, continue, more recruits the next year and there'll be reinforcement. If they don't come back, there won't be, won't be reinforcement and they'll disappear. That's, so that's how, um, how recolonization might occur, for instance. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Okay, so we're breaking for lunch now. We'll be back at one o'clock.